I'd like to talk to you this afternoon about in, an intersection. It's an intersection between this place up here, which is the uh, high altitude mountaineering world. Um, it's a very wild place. It's, there's not much air up there. Uh, it's a treacherous kind of place. You can die fairly easily up there. Uh, and uh, so the intersection between that and what I'm going to call the wilderness of the mind, which uh, after thinking about this for a while, I, I came up with uh, just this one term, ambition. So when you put these things together, uh, you have people with a lot of ambition going to these places. Uh, they go there to t really test themselves. Um, it's a place where very primal feelings come out of a person. And it's maybe a, a, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting place to watch human nature um, come out. So, uh, and after having observed these stories, being involved in some myself over the years, I, I kind of came to um, a bit of a conclusion, which was that a lot of the time you get these very tragic events that occur, very sad stories as a result of all these elements coming together. And it, it sort of, uh, it did lead me to a question eventually. It, it was just, it's unfortunate, but I, I, I ended up asking myself, maybe we are dark. Maybe we are dark. And uh, what do I mean by that exactly? Well, um, that's kind of what I mean. Um, <laughs> the evil side, the dark side. I just wonder, do we all have a little bit of this in us? So, of course, we're all living in a society together. We have to get along with each other. There's a big need for that. And we all have, I think, we all have these ambitions. And we have to somehow reconcile these two things. I'm sure we've all been down that path of trying to figure out this balance between these two things. And uh, I've wrestled with it myself over the years. And I just want to tell you guys today about a particular uh, trip I did where I went down both of these paths at the same time. When I first looked at this quote, I thought it said, the human beast. And uh, that <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> kind of what I think maybe is a bit more fitting in this, but a lot of people have talked about ambition. And, you know, how, how, um, how damaging it can be, how ruthless it can be. It's just, it's just incredible what people are able to do to each other. It's, it's amazing. Well, uh, here is Mount Everest, which I'm sure all of you have heard about before and seen before, too much probably. Uh, it's the highest mountain in the world, so of course it draws people with ambition and certain ambitions to go there and do this, including me. I'd been climbing a long time before I went here, it'd been over 20 years, but I did really, really want to do this. I wanted to do it very badly, very badly. So eventually I found a way to go and get over there, and I, um, by this time, I was not single anymore, a single climber doing whatever I wanted to do. I had married, and I had a daughter, and I had to, it was a big fight, internal fight for me to decide what to do. I was very torn. Do I go on this trip? I really, really want to do this, or do I consider my family, who, as you can see, I mean, this, this photo breaks my heart to look at this photo, because I can see the pain that I am causing my family. It's on their face. And you know, this is my wife and now my ex-wife, which I can tell you is not unrelated to all, all this. And you know, it, I, I have to live with this. I, I did this. I left on this trip. She said later to me, I can't believe you actually left on that trip. I thought you wouldn't go, even at the airport. And I had this cold thing that happened in my head and I just, I just left. I went. I, I did that. Well, I uh, got over to Everest in Tibet, you know, long way away from home, and you sort of forget about it a little bit, and it gets very exciting. You're on this huge mountain, you know, it's the highest peak, and it's very exciting. And we're working on this mountain for weeks and weeks, and uh, going up and down, getting acclimatized, uh, getting exhausted in the process, of course. It was, it's an amazing very incredible experience to be part of, uh, sleeping in some very comfortable camps, as you can see. Uh, 
putting our time in, you know, uh, dealing with uh, swollen up faces from high altitude edema, frozen snot, um, some incredibly great hair days. <laughs> and, you know, basically though, I have to say that it was exciting, incredible to be part of that. I just, I loved it. I loved it. It was, it was wonderful, magic. So uh, we put our six weeks in acclimatizing, get everything set up. We're ready to go for the top. And now, you know, there's, there's a couple hundred people on this mountain. And everybody's ambitions are sort of being distilled into this short two-week period when everybody's going for the top. And the day before uh, me and my team were going to leave, we heard over the radio that another climber uh, who we had met, David, David Sharp, Englishman, you can see him in the photo, uh, had died somewhere high in the mountain. And this story, I, I think, became very symbolic of ambition gone wrong. Uh, David Sharp climbed alone. We don't know if he made it to the top or not, but he wanted that top so badly that he climbed himself to complete exhaustion to the point where he sat down and couldn't get up again. So he's sitting up very high in the mountain on the top part of the ridge. The next morning, another wave of climbers is coming up on their seven attempt, there's 40 people trying for the top this day. And group after group encounter him sitting on the ridge and they, they pass him. And I, I suppose there were a lot of reasons they did that. There was some assumptions that maybe he was just taking a rest or he was with another group or something like that. But the fact is they walked past him. And then during the daylight hours later on, they came back down and this guy was still sitting in the same place. And they realized then, oh my God, you know, this guy, uh, we should have helped him earlier. It's too late to help him now. So it was a tragedy. And unfortunately, the net result was that 40 people went up and down past him and that he died. And you can imagine, you can imagine the sort of, uh, well, the media reaction you can see there. And it's, it's really an example of ambition gone horribly wrong. And, and of course, this is in the background as you head up in the mountain yourself. So we, we made our summit attempt. We went up, we're in the, uh, the high camp here, crawling in there. We had a very stormy uh, afternoon going up there. This is camp three on the north side at 27,000 feet. It's very cozy and comfortable, as you can imagine. Um, you really feel like you shouldn't be up there. It's just there's not much air to breathe. It's quite scary, actually, just to be there. But we, we encountered quite a bad storm. Tents were torn apart. Uh, one of our fellow teammates, the day before had made it to the top. Again, ambition. He climbed until his hands froze. You can see his fingers are purple. And you can also see the look on his face, which is just complete regret uh, at, at what he's done to himself. He's sort of woken up from the stupor that he's been in of, I gotta get to the top of this mountain. And you can just see how much he regrets his decision and it hurts too. Well, we went back down because most people take one crack at the summit and if you don't make it, too bad you go home. But I think you could probably tell from the look on my face that I find it hard to accept. I'm very, I was very distraught, very down about this whole thing. It was, it was a horrible situation, but fortunately myself and a couple of the other guys on the team in the next couple of days decided that, yeah, we, we could try this one more time actually. Everybody else had gone home, 90% of the other people in the teams had gone home. The beauty of that was that we had the mountain to ourselves, which was a nice experience because you've probably seen the pictures of the lineups on, on Everest. Well, there was only a few of us left. So the five of us headed back up the mountain and um, you know, we, we got into camp three, about a week or so after the first attempt. So I'm just gonna show you a quick video of arriving in that camp. I think you can see the people in the red suits in the background. My really great stable camera work there. Uh, so the guys in the background uh, had just come down for the top. And we recognized them from, from base camp, from a team they were with. And I was very excited. I thought, man, we're going we're gonna to get to the top of this mountain. This is, this is awesome. This is fan I felt really good. Went over and said, hey, guys, how did your day go? How was everything up there? And I just got this... Uh, stone cold look from this person and he just said we had one of the worst days of our lives up there we've we lost two people um 
We lost this guy, Thomas Weber, a German climber. And then later in the afternoon, another guy, Lincoln Hall, this Australian guy, died of exhaustion himself. And th he said, if you guys go up there tomorrow, you're going to see them. On they're lying right on the climb, right where you have to go. <sighs> so you can imagine, you know, after all we'd been through, to hear this, this news. Uh, I went back to the tent and told the other guys this news. And we went very quiet that night. There wasn't much talking, hardly any at all. And I think it's safe to say everybody was scared. Everybody was sort of thinking. But nobody said, we're not doing this. This isn't going to happen. The ambition was such that, you know, exhaustion, frostbite, even the possibility of death was not going to set us back, not going to turn us around. I mean, that's in a way how insane it is really looking back on it. So the next clip is just showing us quietly getting ready for this summit attempt. You want to move your bike back here? So, as you can see, we're in perfect health, um, <laughs> ready to make our summit attempt. We left the tent around midnight, and it was a very nice, clear night, and we, okay, it was scary. We started climbing up there, and, you know, um, yes, we passed a couple of these people who hadn't made it along the way, and we just, we just kept going and going, and, and you know, eventually it started to get light. Uh, the next day came around, and, and this is what I saw ahead, and that just blew me away. I thought, oh my God, there's the top of this mountain. After all that, we're going to make it. And I just felt this wave go through me of true elation, you know? I just, it was thrilling, and it wasn't, it wasn't light, and I thought, oh God, we're going to do this, you know? Wonderful. And we continued along the ridge for a while, and then eventually we noticed a sort of flash of color on, on the ridge crest. And as we came closer, we realized there's a person there. And uh, as far as we knew, we were the only people left. There was nobody else trying for the summit that day. So it was, a, it was a bit confusing. And we came right up to the person, quite close to them. And he was sitting down, um, you know, on the ground. And he just looked up at us and he said, um, I imagine you're surprised to see me here. <laughs> Which, uh, <laughs> Very funny person, obviously. Uh, so, yeah, I guess from the looks on our faces, you can tell we were surprised. So we tried to figure out who this person was, and it came out pretty quickly that this is Lincoln Hall, who was one of the guys we've been told had died the day before. So, uh, you know, a bit of anger on our part uh, initially, you know, wondering how could this happen, how another guy got left behind or another week later from by another, what the heck's going on up here? And we were angry, to be honest, at the same time we're thinking, we're trying to go to the top of this thing. You know, come on. What, a, what, a, what does the guy have to do here? Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, but that was short-lived. What, what ended up happening is that because we were dealing with him and, and really looking after him is that we did forget about the summit for quite a while. Um, it was quite hard to deal with him. The, the day before he had made the summit and on his way down, he started to get altitude sickness and he started to hallucinate and things went really awful for him. And uh, his team dragged him down about 200 meters from the summit. He went unconscious. They thought he was dead. It was dark. They'd been out for 20 hours. They had to leave him. It was reported that he had died. His family, everybody believed he was dead. And his team and everybody. And they left him. And it was, they really did think he was gone. And you know, we found him. We took care of him. We gave him water. We put an oxygen mask on him. We stayed for with him for about five hours until he could stand up and, and move. He was in a really awkward position to start with. And basically, that was the morning. And by the time this had all played out and he was okay, it was not possible to go to the top. It was, we had to, everybody went down. So it was over. The summit bid was off. And it wasn't until this sort of played out that I, I felt it. I realized, 
oh God, you know, I'm not going to get this mountain. I can't, I can't believe it. And that's, that's what I was thinking. I love this headline. They uh, very cleverly came up with this one. <laughs> um, partway through the, the rescue. And um, that, that was the last view I remember, which was looking over at Makalu, which was the mountain I always wanted to see, but bittersweet feeling. It's a great view, but going down and I'm not getting the summit. And I have to tell you how disappointed I was. That's how I felt. We went back to the base camp. This is Lincoln. He's all bandaged up from the doctor. He's got pretty bad frostbite. The, he's on a Russian expedition, and they invited us to their base camp. Everybody from our team had gone home, so we're partying with them. They were all so happy to see Lincoln. You know, they were ecstatic. Their friend was back. It was, it was wonderful. Um, we're drinking their white wine, as you can see on, on the table, which in Russian is vodka. I don't know if you know <laughs> it. Very effective at 21,000 feet. <laughs> so it's a good party. And uh, they put Lincoln on a yak couple days later and he had to ride 24 kilometers on this yak back and he was gone and I thought I felt very empty-handed like I'm never gonna see this guy again and it's no summit ah you know that's how I felt well about a week later Dan Mazur who's on the right uh, and myself and the rest of our guys we go back to Kathmandu and I was feeling very sorry for myself kind of licking my wounds you know and into this hotel came Lincoln Hall, looking for Dan and myself. And he said, I just wanted to catch you guys before we all go home and let you know that, uh, well, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for giving up your summit for me. Thank you for getting me out of that predicament I was in. I, I really appreciate it. And when he said that, I felt a couple of different things. One was that I felt very good. That made me feel great. That made me feel great. It was wonderful to hear that. But at the same time, I realized very quickly, uh, I felt quite ashamed of myself because two seconds before that, I had still been thinking about the summit. And I just realized, God, I mean, what more important thing could there be than to consider someone else and, and what, their, what their needs are? That is a way more powerful thing. It was an amazing feeling all of a sudden to experience that. It was interesting to come home and have so many people say to me, that was so much better than getting to the summit. It was incredible. Um, you know, ever since it's been done a million times, who cares? And that's true. I, I, I felt that way going into it, but I never expected to get this out of, out of this trip. It was just a heck of a thing to learn very clearly, very strongly, very powerfully. It was amazing. Uh, Lincoln did have bad frostbite, as you can see. Um, this is him at home. He's got the, they're feeding oxygen to a, into this bubble. And he's trying to recover. Um, eventually, I guess that's as good as it got. And he, uh, he did have surgery. He came here to Calgary uh, the next year. You may remember Bon Connier. He was very nice to us. We went down to his office. We had a great time visiting Lincoln. And we, came, we became very good friends out of this, as you can imagine. Uh, you can see his amputated finger ends there, which he said beats being dead. And uh, <laughs> I might go on a limb here and tell you what else he said, which was that um, a surprising side effect was that it, it made certain body parts appear to be larger. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> He did, you know, was able to go back to his family, which was wonderful for them. They felt, you know, we, we lost him, we got him back. Um, and that was wonderful for a time for them. Uh, I hate to end the presentation this way, but uh, it's almost two years ago now that Lincoln passed away. Um, mesothelioma, which is a kind of cancer you get from asbestos exposure, and he it was exposed to that as a kid, and they think that his, his night out on Everest weakened his system enough to allow that to, to uh, take hold in his body. And so um, you could imagine for myself, for his family, obviously, and everyone involved in that, how much that hurt, what a tragedy that was for, for all of us after everything we went through. Um, I'll always value his friendship, obviously. That's the number one thing. Um, but also, 
it was great to be shown the answer to this question of ambition versus caring for other people or considering other people and which comes first. And you probably know what my conclusion is now. Uh, so back to the original question, maybe we're dark. Unfortunately, I think the answer to that is yes. I think we do have that in us. I am sorry to say that. But knowing that, we all know this, it's in there. Uh, we, we do know better. We know better and uh, we can do better. Thank you very much. <laughs>